we've reached a holiday edition of The Signal Watch. Yuletide movies, television, comics, and more. I'm your host of Christmas Present, Ryan Steens. Join me and our caroling cadre of co-contributors as we examine Christmassy artifacts of the 20th century, merrily explore the 21st, and try to put it all in North Pole-spective. Stay frosty. We're going to try to make this work. holidays from the signal watch as always yes. i'm your host ryan steens and with me today is justin lincoln hello everyone yeah uh we are if, if you're listening to this on soundcloud uh or one of the other streaming platforms be aware uh we are going to be releasing this on youtube as a video it's uh here for our 226th episode and for our um uh, Christmas uh, treat here. We are, I try and do something every year to try and think of something to do. Uh, but this year we're going to release this on video. Um, and so not only is this a day drinking with the movies, this is going to be uh, up on YouTube. So please, uh, you know, go ahead, pour a drink and uh, join us. Yeah. Wow. Justin, what are you, what are you having today? Uh, I'm having a Jen Martini. Which, uh, when I uh, tried to find out, like the uh, the drink most associated with the film, we'll discuss today. It, it it was the gin martini. I'm I myself am also having gin. Um, I'm having a, uh, but I'm having a vesper. Excellent. Um, yes, I'm having. Uh, it is three parts uh, aviation gin and one part. Uh, Tito's vodka and half a part uh Lale. Um, and then of course a lemon twist. Um, and this is uh my my preferred uh cocktail of choice when trying to get there quickly, but happily. <laughs> uh, because I'm I'm a little behind. Uh I, I have I'm I'm trying to catch up uh to be ready and and my mind uh limber for this podcast. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're so glad you could join us for, uh, the, the, just in your movie selection. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, it's, it's a film that, that came up in the, um, the twilight podcast, which, um, I'm thankful for to be invited back. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, if you haven't listened to the Twilight <laughs> podcast, I highly, highly recommend you go back and listen to that one. Uh, Justin was was day drinking the movie. I was not. And uh, the, the conversation wandered. Uh, yes, so. I was day. I was day drunking the movie. <laughs> and not merely day drinking. But uh, yeah, there was a little a little too much bourbon involved in that uh, pre-show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know if anyone's basically called me a rat bastard before on the on the podcast. <laughs> it was earned. It was earned. Oh, well. I mean, I, I know people generally just hold that in in life and on the podcast. <laughs> so <laughs> but I think we're gonna be in more agreement on this particular film. Oh sure, uh, sure. Wait, we weren't in agreement on Twilight? I, I oh, think no. if you go back and listen, we may have had some areas where we were not together one hundred percent. I I think we definitely did. And that's what the, that's what makes conversations fun. <laughs> so this one may be super boring because I don't know how be. much we'll actually debate on this. Uh, let's start with um, how familiar are you with the novel itself? Um, not at all. I'm famously not very much of a reader. I've had a uh, picnic at Hanging Rock sitting on my bedside for far too long. 
even after just watching the film, thinking it would be, oh, this will be an easy read because I kind of know what's going to happen. But uh, no dice. Um, I I picked up the book at half price um, back in like maybe 97, 98. Um, and I, I read it on an airplane. I remember that it's a fairly short book as most Dashiell Hammett books are. Mm -hmm. Um, I've read, I would say 85% of Hammett's output, which was not huge. So that's not an accomplishment. Um, that's like the guy didn't write all that much and I enjoyed it and, and read that, um, he was responsible for, uh, the thin man novel, which spun off into the multiple thin man movies and then the uh the thin man tv series um but he also wrote the continental op which uh you'll hear us talk about a bit jim deadman and i covered uh miller's crossing and the influence of that and um i almost said the blue gardenia that's not right the blue dahlia glass key that's where i was going uh he also wrote the glass key um and so i read all of those things uh when i was doing a lot of traveling and a lot of flying and so I, I have uh, had opportunity to to read quite a bit. The novel is surprisingly close to the film. Um, I think there's some stuff that even in pre-code Hollywood, this movie came out in 1934. Um, and so it's right on the edge before code, code, code stuff was starting to float around. Uh, the novel, I think, is suggesting some things that are not in the book movie in any way shape or form Interesting. but i'll talk about that kind of as we go along so when did you first see the film uh i i it i don't know when i first saw the film uh i don't know if i have ever seen this film with uh under the uh, burden of full sobriety <laughs> so um uh i don't know it was not too recently i mean wait what am i saying it was not too long ago mm -hmm. that I first saw it and then thought, then rewatched it fairly recently. I think just shortly before we did Twilight. Um, so this might, this recent watch for the podcast is probably, um, honestly, maybe number three. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it's definitely something that if you're a classic film fan, uh, like TCM runs it every year during the holiday season. Um, it's, uh, you know, something that gets shown sometimes in revival theaters. Uh, and, and I believe I saw it during the Christmas season, a few, this is many years ago now, I'd say like 11 or 12 years ago, uh, at the Alamo, I believe during the Christmas season. Um, but I, I'd seen it the first time. I would say probably back around like 2004. Um, and then I've watched it. I, I've lost track. This is probably my 10th or 11th time viewing the movie. I've owned it in multiple formats at this point, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I now have a Blu-ray edition, which is the, the more recently scanned, I think 2K edition. Um, I don't have it in 4K or anything like that, but um, it looked really, really good on my new shiny TV and with uh, the, this restoration um, looked better than I'd even seen it on the big screen. So mm -hmm. it was, it was really nice to kind of get to watch it and see uh, Myrna Loy and all her glory uh, sure. all, all, all polished up. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very watchable film for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did see uh, just yesterday, I got my what showing at Austin film society and the thin man is showing for yeah. those who so desire it. Uh, I think right over Christmas, 24th, 25th, something like this. So um, I can't honestly remember if the novel takes place over Christmas. Um, for whatever reason, the film does. Uh, it It is uh, Nick and Nora Charles. Uh, Nick is a former detective from the New York police. And he had at some point in the eh, probably five or six years prior, uh, married young socialite Nora Charles, who was an intellectual match for him. Uh, and the two uh, have returned to New York for the Christmas season uh, to do nothing but pretty much drink their way through Manhattan, <laughs> um, which is kind of what they do. And uh, a, a murder occurs in um, one of Nick's former clients and Nick gets wrapped up in the mystery 
and has to solve it in classic Hammett fashion. So yeah, yeah, and that's uh, and like I would say with, with most films like this, uh, I, I really enjoy kind of losing the plot shortly into the film because the filmmaking and the uh, repartee amongst the characters is is so is so fun that I mean. Um, I get completely lost in who is the murderer, who might be the murderer. I mean, it's 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 the same way with uh, the big sleeper. I mean, that's kind of uh, like a quint- uh, detective story, but uh, I, I really get on board very very quickly with with stories that are, I mean, clearly it's a mystery that get solved by the end but um pardon me uh the kind of the journey to to solving it being almost if not more satisfying than the conclusion is always a great sign for a detective story and this has it in spades yeah i mean i I, if you're a follower of american uh fiction and, and crime fiction um, you know, really the two people who I think carved out the, the 20th century were, were Hammett first and Chandler second, um, doing kind of very different things. But uh, between the two of them, there's a lot of overlap. And I, I think a lot to, um, you know, check out if you if you're if you're a follower of mystery stories at all. And they have adapted um, some of the the Hammett stuff um, and the the Chandler stuff tended to get adapted a little more readily because he was alive or Hammett was alive at the time, but he wasn't in great health, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but he did end up actually writing what turned out to be the treatment for, I believe, Return of the Thin Man, whatever the third one is in the series. Hmm. Um, And they've actually released that as a novel at this point. You can, you can read that it's i don't even know if he finishes it uh but there's enough there that you're like oh yeah yeah i've seen this movie um but he'd never really returned as a full release novel to the nick and nora charles characters after this first novel um but i i agree it's a the, the movie itself is a i have gotten complete when i saw it at the alamo i i you know, I was being driven home. I'll put it that way. Um, it, it, I did not care. I, you know, I was there to spend time with the characters. Um, I was there to, uh, you know, just kind of enjoy the setups. And, um, I do really enjoy the, uh, prestige or the big reveal at the end of this film. I think it's really, really well done. And, oh yeah. 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 The, uh, the, the, um, uh, the whodunit dinner, the murderer is amongst us dinner. Yeah, is uh, just is such a great. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, been used multiple times, but uh, it, it's always fun when it gets pulled off. You know, when yeah. you as the audience are essentially at the table with yeah. everybody else. And I think Agatha Christie was probably doing a lot of this kind of stuff. Like, I haven't read Agatha Christie the way I, I absolutely should. At some point, I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that like Perot was. Um, you know, having kind of like everyone's in the room, I'm going to do the big reveal, you know, sort of thing. And mm-hmm. and it's become kind of a staple now in things like um, Knives Out. I assume we'll have the same thing in Glass Onion when that gets released in a week. Yeah, or so. I hope so. Uh, I mean, I mean. It, it's it's kind of like, well, what is what do you bring into the table with to the table with that? Uh, and, and, and how entertaining can you make it? Mm-hmm. Um, this. I, I think that, you know, despite the fact there's no Nora Charles in this, uh, I mean, you can see the, the um, oh my goodness, I've forgotten the character's name, Benoit LeBlanc. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think you can see a lot of both Perot and, and Nick Charles in the character. Um, the stories yes. are surprisingly serious of what mm-hmm. they're covering, but they're doing it all with kind of a, you know, certain certain uh flair that that you, you can't help but admire yeah yeah it, it's i mean even though uh you know people are getting buried in concrete and dissolved in quicklime it, it's it's very uh, light for, mm-hmm. for the most part um yeah. and i think this movie does a, a really good job of balancing that i mean i was i i think one of my favorite scenes in this uh in the thin man is when um, 
Nick goes to Wynant's, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, they keep calling it a shop. His shop, right. Yeah. And uh, Asta is digging and uh, Nick quickly realizes what it is. And like his care for the dog is like, okay, get away from here. Um, uh, I, I think is a good balance of kind of light and heavy and like the kind heartedness really like he doesn't yeah. want his dog to to realize that oh you're what you're digging after is actually a dead body it's not <laughs> it's not a mouse you know right <laughs> um yeah i mean and that's kind of where if i was to start kind of pointing what the differences are between the novel and, and the film um the the film is more lighthearted, i would say certainly um, I think a lot of this is there. Like Nick and Nora are definitely charming characters you want to spend time with. But the William Powell and Myrna Loy and kind of what W.S. Van Dyke brought to, as the director, brought to the film was really kind of the spirit of the screwball without going that far. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, a screwball, I, 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 yeah, I think you hit it. Like I never... Um, uh, I didn't even think to apply that term to this film, but it is pretty, pretty screwball. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not as crazy as like his girl Friday or other kind of, you know, contemporary films of, of this, you know, fr from this era kind of as um, they're, you know, you're only at this point, six years into talkies, which is kind of the remarkable thing. Like, if wow. You, yeah. Yeah. If you watch this film and, um, I can't believe, honestly, when I watch film go from like knowing it, it's like 20 seconds or whatever of Al Jolson singing mm -hmm. to six years later of, um, you know, this is, is what you're getting. Uh, it, it, it's really remarkable. It, yeah, it, it really is. Uh, I mean, six years is uh, that's ridiculously short for. I can't stand him to yeah. um which is what you get in this is just like yeah. this super rapid fire and the ability of these directors and filmmakers and sound editors and, and sound recordists really to to be able to get all this stuff so like i mean i never would have known that uh, I mean, I mean, yeah i mean it's part of it has to have come from well they came from good source material they had like repartee in the book that they were trying to imitate there's a certain style going on on broadway as well in the 1930s that's able to be kind of brought over um and i i think you know i don't know what the background was of the actual screenwriters who who worked on this film or other films of this era that kind of brought that but it's kind of what you think of when you think of like pre-World War II Broadway anyway. Um, it's it's kind of that. And then you get into like Meredith Wilson plays shortly after and you're in the Music Man, right? So um, it's, it, it, it's uh, I, I think, a really interesting thing that it gets there. The way that tells to me are that there's basically no music in the film. Like the idea of we have to have music all the time. In, as as everyone thinks of in film now um it, it's just not there it's just kind of the hiss of the silence and the the on the soundtrack when you're watching it yeah i i i, I um i i guess i'm so taken by the script and the acting in this that uh on these three views that's kind of yeah gone over the dome that yeah you're right i mean it's it's there's not a lot of music um if any, that's non, what is it? Non diegetic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think that maybe there's like, and you can kind of go back to, I, I think it's in, always interesting to watch like Frankenstein, which is like 32 and it's totally just a, it's, it's practically a silent film, right? It's, it's sure. like characters are talking occasionally. There's long stretches where it's just the hiss on the soundtrack and you can hear their feet stomping around. And then, you know, and, and then you get to Bride of Frankenstein and there's that Franz Waxman score. And um, this doesn't have, but you get into the Thin Man films and by the fifth film, you're on the song of the Thin Man and it's music laden. Um, it's there's, there's a ton of score on that film. Um, and I, I just find it kind of like a really, if you're looking for kind of like keys for like, how do I get into classic film? Kind of what is my, my Rosetta stone? 
I, I really do think the Thin Man series is a really fun way to kind of get what was going on from like 34 into the 40s. Um, and, and William Powell and Myrna Loy, M- M- William Powell had a few people he partnered with, but uh, Myrna Loy was, was definitely the most famous of the pairings. He was probably 20 years older than her when they filmed this, uh, which is supposed to be part of their character dynamic anyway. A lot of times in film that goes ignored. Uh, He'd been around since like 23. He'd been playing like sheiks and, and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, He'd been taken as kind of a very serious actor. And then he made this, this pivot as it's very, very hard for actors to make of like becoming this William Powell. Um, and they not didn't just make these movies. They made uh, Manhattan Melodrama, which is a straight melodrama. Then, but they also made um, like I want to say six other films together, something <laughs> like that. Um, and, and they're they're all really good. They're really well paired. They absolutely know how to work off of each other. Um, but it's it's uh, you know outside of outside of this, they were good friends. But that was pretty much as far as it went. So. They um, so uh, I guess let me ask you this: as somebody who hasn't seen the the others, uh, mm-hmm. are is this the best of the Thin Man series? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not, okay. I'm not going to lie. I'm like, let me let me not you know sugarcoat this. Like, what basically ends up happening is these movies become popular, and as often happens with something that had a little edge to it, the edge starts to disappear more and more after each film. Got it. Um, the second film ends with her like knitting baby boots and you go okay well i know where this is all headed now it's the family of the thin man Mm -hmm. you know that sort of thing and so um they lessen up on the drinking she's basically not drinking by the third movie anymore um is that uh due to changes in what we find acceptable well i mean part of it was now she's a mommy and we're not going to show mommy getting blitzed out of her mind at like two in the afternoon, even if there's like, you know, help with the kid or whatever. Um, I, I want to say, oh God, I want to say an early version of the baby was Dean Stockwell. Wow. I'd have to go back and actually check that. If I'm not right, y'all can IMDB it, but I, I believe like that's how early Dean, Dean Stockwell was in Hollywood. Um and it's uh yeah it, it's they, they they get by the the last one you can tell they're like we're kind of out of steam on this we're kind of doing this because there's an expectation that we put out a thin man movie every few years uh william powell had come back from cancer i think after the second one to do the third one um you'd never know i mean he seems totally fine whatever but apparently that was a big part of his like rehabilitation and coming back was like everyone who had to take care of him on that set you know myrna Loy was good friends with him and um you know they knew they knew how to kind of help carry him through uh on on the film um i i do think that they do they do repeat some things that are some of the fun things from this film um, if you've not seen it, uh, probably one of the most famous scenes in this is like the Christmas party and <laughs> which there's nothing else like it in film. Like there's, there's just not, I, I can't really point to anything else like that scene. Oh it, yeah. It, 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 it's, it's, it's really good. The, the, the poor guy who all he wants to do is cry and call his mom <laughs> is such a uh, scene stealer. Uh, and just, I mean, uh, what a what a what a silly, <laughs> silly thing that has nothing to do with the rest of the movie, as far as I remember. Um, but just adds so much texture to like who these people are, who their friends are, the kinds of people they hang out with. Yeah, um, I mean, it's they they it's his people he popped as a detective mm. that's right that's right you that's and that's the thing about nick he's friends with all the people he arrested uh, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing else like that in film right no I mean, no there, there there for sure isn't um and, and, i mean it has such like a i mean for, for lack of a not knowing a better uh i guess like 
uh, a neutral term. It's got the, the whole film has such a gentlemanly quality about it. Like mm -hmm. uh, that, that like it, it's, it's nice to see where everybody kind of it treats each other pretty well. I mean, e even, even the, the not so great people in, in the film don't get, I mean, they don't get treated like they don't get treated. They don't get knocked down a notch, you know? Right. And I think that's uh, that's uh, fun to see. I like to see, uh, you know, as, as much as I like all the horror films, seeing uh, kindness in movies is, is, is a lot of fun. I, I think that's nice. I think that's what makes this movie so easy to watch. And concerning, bes beside the the intrigue of the plot and the, the good script and, and the good acting, is just such an easy movie to put on kind of whenever because it's it it goes down so smoothly yeah and speaking of smooth your your smoking jacket is really fantastic i hope people are appreciating this if you if you're not watching <laughs> uh, uh i am in fact wearing one of my christmas gifts for this year um uh, my brother-in-law the doug um and, and his wife Kay got me uh, a smoking jacket after me kidding for about 20 years about really needing a smoking jacket so I now actually have one and I can't tell you how totally excited I am about this. <laughs> well, it looks good. Uh, ha have you, uh, I, I don't know if you ever partake of a pipe or a cigar or a cigarette on a really long. Cigarette. Well, the truth is I got this and then the next day COVID hit our house. Oh boy. So um, I did not, I did not get an opportunity to, uh, to, to, uh, yeah, do any uh, fun things wearing an actual <laughs> smoking jacket. This is it. This is the first time okay. I put it on since I tried it on when it came well, out of the gift bag. It's a, it's a fine opportunity to, to put to good use. <laughs> <laughs> in, in your pajamas, likewise. I, I, I yeah, I've been, um, I've been meaning to get a good pair of, uh, uh, like uh, gentleman pajamas and uh here they are have you ever read up on the history of pajamas no does, so does it, have a dark, does it have a dark sordid past to where i'm gonna really regret wearing these pajamas like quite the opposite it, oh, it good. Oh, like God. pajamas the, if you ever heard the phrase the cat's pajamas i have yes uh the the uh pajamas kind of are a 20th century invention like people have just like, like all nothing before that yeah people basically ran mm. around yeah just flapping in the wind no i mean people <laughs> had like the the long dressing skirt or like uh, sleeping yes. whatever the, gowns. Um, the, the scrooge attire yeah and so or they slept in their street clothes and then at some point someone said aha we can sell people like comfortable sleep clothing and pajamas became very cool to have. And that's how it became the cat's pajamas was like a term for cool because you're a cat. So you're already cool. And he's wearing pajamas. That's insanely cool. Yeah, that is the coolest. So and people would like wear pajamas to parties to show how cool they were. Which is what that's... you see in like early film, right? Sometimes when someone's like being really like, you know, Nick Charles hanging out in his pajamas. <laughs> he does. He does. Yeah. So. Anyway, Google it. It's fun. Read up on pajamas. <laughs> I'll do it. Um, um but yeah, I the, the the movie the movie has like some sequences like that. It it has like this kind of screwy cop who can't keep up with Nick, um, who desperately wants to prove he's like Nick's equal and it, it ain't gonna happen, and it's really, really funny. Yeah, um, it, it is, and that guy's good. That guy's got a great face. I mean, he's like what like 50 percent jaw on this guy yeah. is like huge and yeah. and, and again it, it, there's not really and i mean he they're nowhere near equals but it, it's nice that uh he never gets talked down to right. as far as i recall um you know nick kind of lets him have his have his little moments and lets him speculate on like well he did this and she did this and he did this and it's fun. Um, uh, I'm going to be munching every now and then. On oh, Andy Cap hot fries. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> Which, man! Now I'm jealous. I've never had before. What? Um, I, I know they're 
they're pretty good. I mean, I was trying to find hot peanuts. Uh-huh. Um, so Andy Cap's hot fries is. Uh, and I, I, I'm a Andy Cap hot fries fan from from way back. High school was when I started eating wow. Andy Cap hot fries. Yeah, gas stations <laughs> across America have them. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. If you've not had them, they have a. Uh, they're they're kind of a light uh, fried potato sort of stick. Mm -hmm. It's doused in kind of a kind of paprika and and other uh, peppers. Hot, but not too hot. I mean, you can really uh, uh, go to town on them and not uh, regret it. It's a problem. That's why I don't buy them anymore. (laughs) I can see that. (laughs) Um, Yeah. This morning after I had two and a half donuts for breakfast. So that was that's what I've had to eat today Um, while I watch the World Cup. Yeah, what an so, exciting game too for for those who haven't. Um, oh my lord, seen it. Yeah, we're going to digress for a minute. If you did not watch the World Cup, uh, that and that was the first game you ever watched. If it, if you did watch it, you'll never see another game like that again. Oh, I I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I mean, I only tuned in in the last twenty minutes, maybe, mm. and. Um, Throughout the day, I was trying to get as much done as I could to make myself um, a productive member of society before recording this podcast and delving into uh, gin martinis. Uh, but all around the stores, all I could hear is people saying, oh, my God, it's now this score to this score. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't remember the U.S. being this invested in World Cup ever at this level. Uh, no, and I, I certainly think the uh, uh, Austin getting a, a team that you know, it is fun to watch and I, I think did pretty decent this season. We did great right? Maybe. this year. Yeah. I'm a well, big Austin FC fan. Yeah. Yeah. We only we 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 did go to one game, which was an absolute blast. And um my daughter did nothing but scream at referees for the, <laughs> the entire time. I don't think she knew what she was talking about, but she really had a uh, great deal of fun throwing up her arms and saying, Come on, come on. So I, I, I went scarf. to one game. I went to the playoff game where we beat Dallas Salt Lake. And um, I, I would remember if I weren't in like a, a drink and a half in. Um, and I sat in the supporter section. I went with a coworker who was a supporter and highly, highly recommend it. It's uh, if you can get in into that area, it's the people are insane. I was hugging people who I'd never met before. Um, it was it was when we won on on penalty kicks that that playoff game. So excellent, yeah. Sweated my balls off. It was so <laughs> freaking hot that day. Oh yeah, yeah. We were um, so the ta- the the Tanya company works for the company Tanya works for is uh, I think they have a booth and things like that. So every now and then they get uh, they they get like heavily discounted tickets, and so that's how we went. But still. The sun, like now I know which side to sit on. Right. Not not the side we sat on. Yeah. You sit uh, on the west side. Yeah. Yeah. It got it got real hot. Um, yeah. Is that Bill the cat behind you? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't changed since sixth grade. It's okay. It's Bill the cat. <laughs> I was like, that's not uh, that's not uh, Street Fight Garfield. That's uh, <laughs> Bill Bill the cat. Yeah. Good. Good, good. <laughs> um, but we did watch a movie. Uh, so there's also some other sequences I really like. We watched in the, the film. Thin Man for those who have, because I don't think we ever. No, no, no. It's 1934 is the yes, Thin yes. Man. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, if if you haven't seen it, what it's about? <laughs> yeah, how uh, far are we into this? And we're yeah, yeah, no. Uh, but yeah, I mean it. So it, it, we should probably talk about the actual plot. So there's a, a a girl who approaches Nick in a bar when he's having cocktails. It's a one of the best introductory scenes in oh, a film. Uh, yes, I mean not only Nick's intro, but Nora's intro and Asta's intro. It is it's truly like everybody gets like the primo intro. And you're at like 11 minutes when Nora walks onto the screen, mm-hmm. dragged you're... onto dragged on by that cute little dog. <laughs> Um, yeah, Nora, Nora is, is introduced carrying all of the shopping she's done and, and walking their, their, uh, wire hair terrier, um, fox terrier, uh, Asta 
who is a bit of a staple of pop culture. If you look around, uh, you probably you may have known someone who had a dog named Asta and not known why. Um, you may have not known why the dog was named that. You may have known why you knew the dog. Mm-hmm. Um, but the uh, but yeah, it's it's an absolutely fabulous introduction to the characters. You know everything about them that you need to know. They're married. They're incredibly in love. Mm-hmm. Um, she's rich and gorgeous and he's somehow this like working class dude who has been very smart but married married this girl somehow met and married um and you know all of this like that like if you're looking to figure out how to write a screenplay and introduce your very charming ass characters immediately <laughs> this is this is i mean you also cast Myrna Loy and and William Powell i mean that th- that does not hurt and so every once in a while they talk about remaking the thin man and everybody who knows the movie goes boo don't do it um and i'm i'm in agreement frankly like i i think that if you're going to do it the risks are so high that you're going to look like a fool compared to what van dyke was able to do with this film that i i think you're running an enormous risk uh yeah i think so too i i i was uh, i will save the question i will save you from the question of if they remade it who would they make it with but um yeah i i i think well that... at one point they were trying to remake it with johnny depp and i believe amber heard pause Lots. for reflection <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, I guess I could see him. And why not her, but... um, I mean, I think I know legally why now we're glad that didn't happen, but... Oh, sure, sure. Um, uh, I also think it'd be really hard to make a movie now about functional alcoholics. We can make a podcast where we're functional alcoholics. We do. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's really there. hard in 2022 to do that without Twitter going. Are Nick and Nora Charles okay? <laughs> and the answer was, yeah, they're doing fine. Yeah. Oh my gosh! For those who are listening to this in the future, Twitter's great. <laughs> <laughs> Can't imagine what would go wrong. We Twitter. all came together. It really, really solidified this yeah. nation discourse meant we all really discovered each other yeah we did we were cool (laughs) um yeah no i can't i i mean it with today's actors i i really i mean i'm sure there's some out there that i'd be delighted to hear we're playing like nick and nora um it's hard to imagine who would have that same level of chemistry at this point um if i were to try to guess you're on video now like trying to hide that you're eating your Andy Cap hot fries. I just so, didn't want it to be loud. I want it to be loud. I want that to be part of the podcast. Oh, yeah. There's that crunch you only get with an Andy Cap hot fry. This podcast not brought to you by Andy Cap hot fries. So, Unless... but, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I there's, there's, you do get to the dinner sequence. We talked, we referred to that a little bit earlier. There's a lot of water between there, between the mm. beginning of the movie and, and meeting Nick in, in that sequence. And there is absolutely murder and mayhem. Uh, there's the crazy kind of ex-wife of... The, so the thin man is not Nick Charles. Everybody always thinks it's Nick Charles. The thin man is the guy who's missing at the beginning of the film. Right. Uh, and it, uh, God, now his last name has escaped me um, because I've several Wynant? drinks in wine it so because wine has disappeared he in the book he's described as being like six foot and like 100 pounds like he's he's you know this really lanky kooky scientist guy um and in him disappearing uh you know it sets off the mystery of like in like years ago nick worked on a uh someone was threatening to kill him and he was around for a whole bunch of time with the Wynant family he did not know that the young daughter had developed a crush on him in the book a lot more is made out of the crush um of her kind of keep coming back to nick and and nora and she actually stays with them for a while in the book I will also say, reading between the lines, I'm not exactly sure that they're not suggesting that Nora and the girl sleep together. 
Um, I, I, I don't know. Like, I think that there's some like kind of dot, dot, dot stuff that I'm reading too much into, but it's, it gets kind of like, wait, what, what just happened? Um, and so I'd have to go back and read the book. I don't know if anybody else has ever had that interpretation reading the book. So, well, I will now, <laughs> but it, um, it, uh the the mother is completely insane and like unhinged uh of mm-hmm. the girl and she's obviously like feeling sexually competitive with her daughter uh, in this movie the daughter dorothy is played by maureen sullivan and and i'm gonna say something i don't like saying i don't like maureen sullivan i've never liked maureen sullivan she's in a whole bunch of stuff from this era uh including tarzan and i always think she's indicating and i don't know a nice way to say that so I don't feel like she's acting. I feel like she's kind of just like, this is what it looks like to be mad. This is what it looks like to be angry. And I, I don't think she's and, and somehow she just moved from movie to movie and had a mm. successful career, but she's not my favorite actor from this era. Fair enough. Um, there's also a brother in this who is Gilbert, who is mm. awesome. She died in Scottsdale, Arizona. Maureen Sullivan. A shocking Apparently. number of actors ended up in Scottsdale, and I don't really where, know. Where in Arizona was it that you were at one point? Was it Scottsdale? So the Phoenix Metroplex has a lot of bedroom communities around it. I was in Chandler, and Scottsdale okay, was right. probably 30 minutes away. So you could have killed her. Okay. I, I didn't, um, but I'm not saying I didn't go, hmm, when she <laughs> passed. No, I did not. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I didn't say that. I did. No, I didn't. <laughs> well, let's see. No, she died in 98. I At wasn't. First, I, I reread that as 89, and I thought be like dressing up as Batman at that time. So we <laughs> we have plausible deniability. <laughs> um, I don't think I knew who she was in 98. Um, but yeah, uh, it, Gilbert is the brother, and he is a bit of a he's a major crackpot. Um, who, like, yeah, I, books, yeah, and it totally admits to his Oedipal fetish, and like it's really fun. Like, you mm-hmm. don't see this after the Hayes Code comes in. No, no, he he he's super, uh, he's super silly, and he really adds a lot of fun to the movie when when, when he shows up, yeah. The 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 very horny mom is married to uh she also in the book way, way, way tries to get into bed with Nick like 10 times more than she does in this movie. Um in but here she's married to Cesar Romero, uh, who is Jurgison, I want to say. Yes. Um and unfortunately it's very young Cesar Romero, so they don't give him a lot to do. And if you know Cesar Romero at all, you're like, oh, give him more to do. Like he's so good. Uh, but it's good to see him as kind of like young, handsome Cesar Romero. Yeah. Yeah. There are there are plenty of good mustaches in this movie. <laughs> yes. yes. He's yeah. it's before he has the full Cesar Romero. So you have to imagine <laughs> a, a like mid thirties Cesar Romero. But yeah, it, it yeah, it's it, they they are refined mustaches for sure. Yes. Um, the actual villain of the piece, as it turns out, I'll go ahead and spoil it. Turn it off now if you don't want it spoiled. Is played by uh, Porter Hall, uh, who plays Macaulay. It turns out the attorney did it at the very end of the film. And he, um, I want to tell you other movies he has been in, because I believe he's in Miracle on 34th Street uh, as the villain. Um, Sullivan's Travels, Double Indemnity, uh, Ace in the Hole. Um, he, anyway, he was just in a whole bunch of stuff, and you will see him in this film and go, that guy seems a little slimy. Well, that's what happened back in the days of central casting. Um, like They would be like, we need someone who clearly is the guy who killed the guy, uh, <laughs> but we need him to not seem like maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Um, we're going to have all these other colorful characters that you're going to maybe suspected it, but, um, it's, it's this guy. So he's not the guy from Miracle on 34th street. This is melting my brain. Who is that guy? Huh? There's two guys. No, he is him. He is him. 
so he plays the psychologist who gets santa sent to um jail in in miracle on 34th street so our trust of psychology in 1946 (laughs) well you know there's a podcast for later psychology in the 40s versus the 50s um anyway uh any other scenes you want to call out oh god i have hands full of andy caps hot fries uh it's very difficult for me to uh reach for my notes at this time <laughs> but i will do my best so i'll everyone. talk about myrna loy while you think about it um i'll listen myrna loy, myrna loy uh the actors who worked with her always had kind of a saying of if i think jimmy stewart put it best of any man who does not want to marry Myrna Loy should be arrested. Um, I yeah, that sounds right. Right? You, I mean, like, not only do you not go against whatever Jimmy Stewart says, but when he speaks the truth, you doubly don't do it. Wildly attractive. Um, she's also hilarious. Like good combination to have. Um, and if you don't feel that way about your own wife, I pity everybody out there i know i feel that way about mrs the leak oh um but she uh you can watch her in kind of film after film uh where she if you've ever seen mr blanding's dream house um and then she can also do drama is the great thing um if you've never seen uh the uh best years of our lives absolutely heartbreaking I've that. not seen that, but I really want to. Oh man, that's we a, should we should absolutely do that. It's it's uh that's so much post-war... about what's that post war movie? It's about it's about okay. coming back from the war. Yeah, and she's the wife of a guy who kind of finally found meaning in his life. I mean, beyond Hearth and Home, uh, when he was yeah overseas. So, um, but yeah, I mean, she she had this amazing career she um was kind of recognized as this great beauty as far back as when she was in high school if you go back and watch greece uh when they're coming out of the front of the high school this is in hollywood where of course they filmed greece and um they there's a statue they're all kind of singing and dancing around that is actually a statue of myrna loy like uh she had been a a uh, student at that high school, the art teacher had been like, what an amazing beauty we have here. And he made a sculpture of her and put it in front of the school and called it like inspiration or something like that. Would you rather have the Robocop statue or the Myrna Loy statue? <sighs> I'm not ready for this King Solomon moment. Um, this is, by the way, the second time in 24 hours, the Robocop statue has come up in my life. Only the second time? Yeah. <laughs> Completely unrelated. Last night, my good friend Juan Diaz was asking me about how much I wanted a RoboCop statue. Um, I think I'd go for Myrna Loy at this point in my life. Yeah, I, I, I like it. I like that answer. Like, RoboCop is kind of indicative of a whole lot of my life. But Myrna Loy is, I feel like, at a deeper level, my life. So, yeah, Myrna Loy. Okay. Yeah. Done. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, and what's crazy is she's kind of been forgotten, I feel like. Like, I, I think, like, people who know film kind of know her. Classic film people, she's bread and butter. Because she's in so much for Mm. like 40 years there. Um, She's in, you know, she was also very, very good friends with Joan Crawford. Um, They had come up in kind of silence and into uh, the kind of first sound films together. Uh, So Joan Crawford shows up and it's like the silent era. And suddenly they're like, we got music. We got like, and they're like, well, we can dance. And so they're in movies together in the chorus before they're ever big stars. And they apparently were hanging out and whatnot. So like when Christina Crawford puts out Mommy Dearest, Myrna Loy is like, that ungrateful bitch doesn't know what she's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and it uh it it anyway she was just basically this like huge staple and i'm shocked how many people want to who are big film buffs who who but they all pretty much follow stuff from like the 60s to now just don't know myrna loy and i'm like but she was the best of american cinema for like 40 years and somehow uh people just don't seem to know outside of the thin man so look into myrna loy yeah, it, it, it it's funny the way that uh, really good people disappear. All right, you were looking for scenes. You were looking through your notes as you finished oh eating calf hot fries. Well, the problem is I didn't ever stop eating those anti calf hot fries until just now. We need to get sponsorship. <laughs> is my take oh my away. god, they're really good. I mean, I've right? never had them. I almost bought them. I almost bought a case for you and Jamie as a joke last year but i i I couldn't was getting nothing was available and it was going to be like a 60 dollar i mean not that i shouldn't have set a price well uh, not that y'all aren't worth it but (laughs) you're like you're allowed to set a price on handicap hot fries okay yeah they were too expensive yeah, no, that's that's fine. Uh, They're like eighty nine cents a bag. If you'd spent sixty dollars on eighty cap hot fries, I would have been shocked. I, I hope you would have been slightly disappointed too. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I, did you read Andy Cap in the paper growing up? Only when I would go to my grandparents' house. Right. I that seemed like the right time. Right, my my grandfather, who was born in Finland in eighteen ninety eight loved Andy Cap more than any other fictional character. He he just thought that was like dead on. And if you saw my grandfather with my grandmother, they looked exactly like Andy Cap and Wheezy. <laughs> it was uncanny. He still wore a flat cap like through like Very the nice. 70s and 80s and all that, which is to this day why I wear a flat cap. Well, they're good. Yeah. And he uh, he just was like, yeah, you come home drunk and your wife like hits you with a rolling pin. That's just life. <laughs> I was like, what happened to you in the 40s and 50s, sir? But... Um, let's see. I, I try to read my handwriting from watching this. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't think I've ever watched The Thin Man under the threat of sobriety. Uh, I wrote down hashtag squad goals, which I think Nick and Nora are pretty perfect. Yes. Uh, oh, that was a horrible note. Uh, I, I did notice that the fedoras in this film are very much more refined. I think some of the early films we watched have like real beat up fedoras. Mm-hmm. And this is what, like 30 34. Six, 34. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess we were taking our hat wear a little more seriously at the time, or at least taking. Well, they're a also care living in a higher, like upper crust, right? They're they're yeah uh, yeah. Because I think in Laura, I, I recall them being pretty pretty beat up. Yeah. Well, he's he's a cop. He's living on a cop salary. He's he, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh. Uh. I did not do this today, and I'm ashamed to say I did not shake my um, uh, my martini to waltz time. I I will be honest, and I'll show it on video if anybody wants to see. I'm realizing how much of this I've had. Uh, this is I stirred my cocktail, and it's a vesper. You s- okay? Because I used this to make it. Well, so. when you yeah, sure, you don't want to. Yeah. Um, I wrote down the term or the phrase lanky brunettes with vertical jaws, which is pretty great, <laughs> which I, I, I don't know why I wrote that down, but I assume that is, uh, Nick describing his, type. it's him describing his type. Yes. Uh, I wrote down who cares what the plot is when you've got vibes like this, <laughs> the, the movie is, uh, to use modern terms full of vibes like the vibes of this movie are great i mean when you get a when you get a movie with good vibes like i I almost think that's more important than anything else i think when i think uh i think when 
when the acting, when the writing, when the directing, when the cinematography and sound design, I think when that all comes together, it's greater than, is that? Um, it's Voltron. It's greater than the sum of its yeah, parts. Yeah, that's like film 101. Is that, uh, is that synergy? Yes. Is that, um, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I there's two sequences in this film that I think really speak to that, and they, they happen to be back to back. Um, Nick and Nora have, well, there's three, because we talked about the party. And then after the party, Nick and Nora go to bed. And there's a knock at the door, and a gangster comes to talk to Nick. And it should be this incredibly intense scene where a gangster has got a gun on Nick and they're in their bedroom and the guy's oh. like, I didn't do it. Um, and Nick gets the information out of him he wants. And then he turns around and cold cocks his wife yes. to basically get her away from him. Mm -hmm. And so she falls off the side of the bed and then he throws a pillow at the, the, as the cops are bursting in, um, throws a pillow and knocks the, the crook off balance. And it's both incredibly dangerous and you get that, mm -hmm. but it's also played for laughs. It's a really, really delicate scene that I, I've never seen done quite this way in other films um and it it just works and then they wake up in the morning and they're still hung over and they don't really care that there was a gun in the apartment the night before or the hotel room the night before they're just having like hung over christmas morning and you talk about vibes like that's one of the most famous scenes in cinema if you know cinema and it's just them being very very hung over on christmas morning with Nora sweltering in her gorgeous fur <laughs> and Nick playing with the kid's pop gun. And you know everything you need to know about these characters from this sequence of Nora just sitting there watching him going, my husband's a boob, but I also am enabling him to be a boob and Nick being a boob, like shooting at the balloons on their Christmas tree that the drunks put there the night before. And shooting them out with his new BB gun that she got him. And eventually, like, plot happens. But... Yeah, so I, 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 I'm gonna, I'm going to cut in for a moment. I love that Nick is more than satisfied by this little BB gun. Yes. That he, like, uses his feet. He, like, kicks up his feet and uses his feet to, like, steady his aim. He's overjoyed with this, like, dinky little present and uh i love that she's got her new wristwatch and she's got this fur coat and he just keeps asking her like who got those for you and she just keeps saying you got them for me <laughs> yeah and at the end it, of the day she got them for her yes yes for sure for sure they, i mean the the relationship is is really wonderful and um they're such equals. Like I, I don't. Um, uh, it's so well written. It's 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 so well done. It, it really transforms and uh, not uh, what's the right term leaps over any any oddness that there may be by the fact that they are their age is like wildly different. Um, they're they're such a great movie couple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you've not seen it, I think Double Wedding is the movie I'm thinking of. Uh, that's a really good one with the both of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're just such a joy to watch together. Um, they even, there's a drama sort of about, um, the Zigfield Follies that stars William Powell and she shows up in the back half. Um, and she's so good in it again. Uh, and so, you know, I'm just trying to throw some recommendations out there for y'all. The good news is back in like 2005, they put out like a DVD set of like everything they'd done together. That wasn't the thin man. It's really easy to get. I think still uh, Paul actually gifted it to me years ago. Um, and I just blazed through it in like a weekend. Um, and I, I can't really recommend like this era of filmmaking enough. Like it's, 
it's so raw and um like you know there's no special effects it's all script it's all talent it's all like you either have it or you don't so stuff that's that succeeded and kind of survived to this era has like such a good quality to it that a lot of like what you think of with classic film kind of just fades away and you can kind of see stuff of like oh this is what people have been imitating now for now 90 years right uh 80 90 years and so Mm -hmm. it it's I mean, of course, some of it's dated, some of it, you know, you will find objectionable by today's societal terms or whatever. Um, And I I don't dismiss any of that, but um, I I highly, highly recommend going back and taking a look at a lot of the other work they do. But do start with The Thin Man. Like, it's, it's totally like, if you're looking to get into classic film, like I said earlier, it's a great Rosetta Stone. Kind of give you an idea of what was going on in this decade if like the earliest films you've seen have been in like the sixties and seventies, which is I think true for a lot of us who are in our forties. Um, and so do, do absolutely give this um, movie a shot and, and Christmas is probably the best time to do it. Uh, yeah. Oh, for, for sure. For sure. And, and it's this, this movie is such a, such a very easy watch. Um, I will say one thing with this, yeah. um, this, this uh, Christmas day scene. Uh <laughs> When Nora says, I heard you were shot twice in the tabloids. <laughs> he says, you didn't come anywhere near my tabloids. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was not in the book. This okay. is this is why this movie is so good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really, I, I kept expecting, I mean, I know Lee Brackett, or not Lee Brackett, who's Lee Brackett's dad? <laughs> Charles Brackett. Like, what, I know Charles Brackett did um, the Big Sleep, but I no, no, Lee it. Brackett did the Big Sleep. Really? Yes. Well, I I guess I kept uh, uh, boy oh boy Lee Brackett. Um, I, I I I thought I was going to see a bracket in the uh, the the writing credits for this. Oh yeah 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 I can see why. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of like little throwaway lines that they have kind of between them. Uh, the dinner scene famously has the like, will you please serve the nuts? I mean, will you please oh. serve <laughs> the guests, guests. Are the nuts? <laughs> um, and which sounds really corny when I'm trying to deliver it, but in the moment it is the funniest fucking line. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm several drinks in. I'm not sure how much else I have to say about this film that isn't just like absolutely glowing. No, it's hard not to love damn near every second of this movie. Mm-hmm. I, I do recall like the last watch before this, I recall thinking I wasn't as enamored with the actual murder mystery as I thought I was the first time, but this recent watch, I realized I was wrong. It all works. Everything works really, really well. So yeah, that's probably worth talking about. So um, Dashiell Hammett himself had been a Pinkerton detective and um, that should not be dismissed lightly. Uh, The Pinkertons, you're talking about like the 19 teens, 1910s when he'd been a Pinkerton um, he then gotten married and basically abandoned his family because Dashiell Hammett. Um, I have been in what was his apartment he was in when he wrote uh, The Maltese Falcon. Um, and it's across the street from my friend Jennifer's apartment, which is super weird. <laughs> um, if you So if you ever see uh, Jennifer uh, referred to uh, in on Twitter or other places that she, she lives across the street from Dashiell Hammett. It's ghost. Um, but, uh, he, he'd been a detective and he, um, he actually knew how all of this stuff worked, which makes the continental op stuff really interesting of what was actually going on in 20th century America and what could he kind of extrapolate from his experience. Um, 
he ended up marrying Lillian, or at least being domestic partners with Lillian Hellman, who was a incredibly renowned uh, stage play writer. She wrote uh, Little Foxes, uh, Watch on the Rhine, and other really important works around the World War II era. And there's a lot of thought that Lillian Hellman is basically Nora Charles, uh, which does we not that- seem at all like crazy. Like she was incredibly smart, incredibly witty, etc. Um, but when you get into his like actual mystery stories, uh, they're, they're intense to put it mildly. Um, I, I can't really recommend picking up a Dashiell Hammett collection enough. Um, they're, they're really, really engaging and starting with something like Red Harvest could be a lot of fun because it's so much like Miller's Crossing. If you've ever seen that. Um, that and if that, you haven't, then, then you're dead to us. Yeah, go <laughs> screw. <laughs> the only uh, one of his I've read was the Dane Curse. Oh, the Dane! I forgot about the Dane Curse, which I think is really interesting. Like it, it, it really hit buttons for me as far as like, like supernatural. I'm so buttons. I read the I Dane watching. Curse while I was sitting in my hotel room stranded in las vegas after 9 11 hmm. that's the last time i read it it's time for a reread yeah was there methane leaking into the room dude anything could have been happening at that point and i wouldn't have noticed i will tell you that much about being stuck in the fucking luxor right next to the airport during 9 11 um i was in a big pyramid that felt like it was a big target <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we were stuck there for an additional, like, four days in Vegas. Um, so that was the last time I read The Dane Curse. Man, it's been a long time. And I get The Dane Curse for some reason really mixed up, because then I went and read The Big Sleep immediately afterward. And for some reason in my head, they're the same story. And they're not. No. So, um, and I'm very drunk right now. Well, I've been trying to do the uh, Jackie Gleason thing of putting olives into my drink but not eating the olives so i could keep tabs of how many drinks i've had which apparently he would order his martinis with an olive and he would not eat the olive but he would like that would be his that's his counter that would be his yes drunkenness abacus so my drunkenness abacus is this is my empty uh mixer and i had two vespers in this Mm. that I started drinking about an hour ago. So I am day drinking the movies as am I. And it's a hoot. Um, Yeah. It's, it's, it's fun. (laughs) Uh, Um, But yeah, I, 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 I think that, you know, again, I've talked about this as being kind of like the the kind of a, a great entryway into classic film and and into kind of these mystery films, um, and kind of how they've moved all the way into like Glass Onion and these other things that are kind of coming out now. Um, and I, I hope I've kind of like talked enough about William Powell and 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 Myrna Loy certainly. Uh, when you get into the sequels, uh, you start seeing some interesting guest folks. Jimmy Stewart is in the sequel. Um, in a, in I think in the third film, you get uh, Shemp. <laughs> uh, which is Shemp weird because the... he's yeah. not with the other Stooges. It's pre-Stooges being big. Um, and uh, But yeah, you start getting these kind of like appearances. By the fifth movie, you have Gloria Graham. Is there? Okay. They just drop Gloria Graham into one of these films, uh, and uh, if ever there was an object of Hollywood uh, lust, there's Gloria Graham. Um, so yeah, I I, I do think uh, it's worth watching all five of these. It's a good way to spend the holidays. But this is the only one that takes place at Christmas. The next one takes place when they get off the train in San Francisco in New uh, New Year's Eve, I believe. So. And it's a lot of fun. So yeah, I, I, I was I enjoyed this one so much uh, that I've been nervous to watch any others. Um, but uh, your recommendation will take me to 
watching all of them. It's a good thing to marathon if you're you have some downtime away from yeah. work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean they definitely get lighter as they go along, but yeah. All right, everybody. Well, happy holidays. This is going to be our final yeah. holiday film, and um, I hope you have enjoyed the ride with us. I hope you've enjoyed. I guess actually seeing my face after 225 episodes and Justin's Mm -hmm. face and Justin, you've been here for several episodes. I have. I have. um, Um, Go ahead, sir. Well, I was just going to say that uh, maybe two or three years ago when you and Jamie last hosted a holiday party, I was speaking with Jamie and she said, you know what? You and Ryan should talk about noir movies on his podcast so if this would not occur this would never have happened without jamie so we'll she's my say... own personal nora charles <laughs> he's my own myrna loy that is absolutely <laughs> true so special kudos to jamie always and to tanya hmm. yeah who's who's um I don't know, asleep or something like this. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, happy holidays, everybody. And I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. And uh, and I really hope you watched it over video so you can see Justin and I's actual faces and his pajamas, which are fantastic. And your smoking jacket. Yes. I can't believe you didn't mention the bow tie. Well, I was I was about to, but I didn't I didn't want to come across as like too uh, uh... This was seven dollars. <laughs> I think somewhere I still have my movie theater bow tie that's like ninety percent popcorn oil, like ten percent polyester at this point. <laughs> but it is it's very nice. It it is it is really lovely. Yours, not my old one. I, I would I would like to see your old movie manager outfit at one <laughs> oh. of these videos. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so get into your stuff from that era. I would not. I, I yeah, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like pleats? Do people like pleats? <laughs> oh, people love it. It was pleats. a different time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, you guys have a happy holidays, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That about wraps it up for this edition of The Signal Watch, a production of the League of Melbotus. Thanks for sticking with us. If you enjoyed the podcast, we invite you to drop on by The Signal Watch blog, where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more. We'd love to hear from you, so find us online and let us know what you think. Whether you prefer email, blog comments, or social media, we'll be happy to hear from you. We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind. <laughs>